this is the last stage uh, of this long journey, but hopefully we will survive. <laughs> we, have, we seem to be having a lot of attrition, but that's okay. Okay, so heterogeneous agent models, that makes us change a little bit gears. This is a slightly different from what we have been doing uh, this during the first sessions. So basically, everything that we learned was about how to compute all these business cycle models that are either uh, with a representative agent or with a very trivial form of heterogeneity. But there are many, many situations where we really want to handle models with real heterogeneity, with non-trivial heterogeneity. So the typical examples include, for example, uh, for instance, heterogeneity in age. So take your favorite overlapping generation model. There is going to be younger people, and there is going to be older people, and there is people in the middle. And you know, imagine that you want to write a paper about social security. How can you have a paper about social security if you don't have heterogeneity in age? There are not people retiring. There are younger people. There are people in the middle. So that's something that you definitely need. A very interesting problem, heterogeneity in preferences. Okay, so when you actually talk with microeconometricians, they will tell you that there seem to be a lot of heterogeneity in preferences out there. That you see people with absolutely the same observables, and, yes, and yet picking very, very different things in life. Uh, this is interesting, for example, because of issues like risk sharing. Think about the following situation. Imagine that I'm very risk adverse, and there are people who are less risk adverse, and we go through the business cycle. So the optimal allocation will be for me, who I'm very little risk adverse, to take a lot of the heat of the recession, while those who are less risk adverse are the ones that are very sure against this thing. So you are going to have a very rich set of predictions about how to allocate risk, etc. Uh, heterogeneity in abilities. You know, I think I can do a fair job of teaching macro. I don't think I will do a very good job teaching I don't know, Japanese, even if just because I don't speak a single word of it. Okay? So there is a lot of heterogeneity in the, uh, in the job market, and this is, this is particularly important, for example, if we want to think about issues like today. So some people have argued maybe the reason why the job market is not working that well lately is because people have different set of skills than the ones that are needed right now. Well, I don't know if this is true or not, but at least it's an interesting assumption, or an interesting hypothesis to explore a little bit more. Uh, heterogeneity in policies. So I think here the clearest possible example that we could think of is the idea of progressive marginal tax rates. Okay? If we really want to think about uh, tax rates that look like the actual tax schedules that we see in the data, you need to have some type of heterogeneity. There needs to be rich people that pay higher marginal tax rates than poor people. Otherwise, the whole thing the whole issue is uh, completely irrelevant. So the issue is why in the world we want to think about all this very rich heterogeneity from this general equilibrium perspective. Because in fact, there is a tradition in micro of thinking about models with a lot of rich heterogeneity, and yet they do it from a very, very partial equilibrium perspective. Okay? So kind of arguments that uh, people have presented over the years about why we want to do this it's first of all because we are going to impose a lot of discipline. We will see that one of the interesting things that is going to happen in general equilibrium is that the relation between the discount factor and the interest rate is going to be endogenous, and there is actually going to be non-trivially endogenous. It's not going to be the case that beta is just the inverse of the interest rate, or the other way around, the interest rate is just the inverse of beta. There's going to be something more going on. It's going to generate an endogenous consumption and wealth distribution, and hence, we can go to the data and see if what we observe in the data looks like anything that the model generates. So we know that the wealth distribution in the US has become more unequal over the last 25 years, 30 years. You know, what type of features we need to introduce in the model to generate that? Was this technological change? Was this change in policies? Was this just change in abilities in the population? So you have different theories, different hypotheses, and you want to have a model that will speak to those in, an, in, a, in a serious and disciplined way. And finally, because it enables what I'm going to call meaningful policy experiments. At the end of the day, 
you know, we want to say things like what happens, imagine that we are really seriously interested in fiscal policy, okay? What will happen if I change the marginal tax rates? If I change, you know, these days it seems that Congress, one of the things of the agreement between the President and Congress may be that they will change the marginal tax rates a lot. Uh, what is going to be the effect of that? So we want to have a model where there are different types of people and uh, they respond to these things and, you know, we can come with a number and say, you know, I believe it or I don't believe it and so on and so forth, okay? Before I get into more details, I only want to point out that uh, a lot of this material I borrow from my colleague, Dirk Kruger, who teaches a class on heterogeneous agent models at Penn. So I figured out that I may as well uh, follow a lot of his explanations instead of basically recooking uh, the whole thing myself. Um, Actually, my young market paper was on heterogeneous agents and it was with Dirk Kruger, so, you know, everything stays at home anyway. <laughs> okay, and it's my most cited paper, by the way, but, you know, uh, which means that my life has only been going down since then. But anyway, that's a different issue. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the first, uh, there are many, many ways to think about heterogeneity. Uh, many, many dimensions where we can really think about uh, how these heterogeneous agents models work. But I think that the best possible uh, way to get into this literature is to think about what sometimes is known as a Yagari model or Willy Ayagari. Uh, for Rao Ayagari, who used to be a professor at Minnesota and Rochester, unfortunately, he died very young. And the idea is the following. We are going to have a continuum of individuals between zero and one, and each of them is going to face what I'm going to call an income fluctuation problem. That is, they are going to wake up in the morning, and sometimes they are going to be very productive, and sometimes they are not going to be very productive. But there is not going to be any aggregate uncertainty. Okay? So this basically means that, you know, on the aggregate, everything is stationary, everything is constant. It's only at the individual level. This is going to be already a very rich and interesting model to think about that is going to teach us a lot of things. And later in this lecture today, I will introduce this, sorry, this aggregate uncertainty. Okay? Every person, so the labor income is going to be equal to how productive you are or, you know, your labor endowment. You can think also about, you know, how many hours you have of work in that day times the wage. So the labor endowment of everyone is going to be the same. Doesn't matter, uh, sorry, the process, not the realization. So I'm agent 0 0.329 uh, and you are agent 0.259. We follow the same process except that, you know, I may get high today and you low and tomorrow is the other way around. You get high and I get low. And to make things easy, that process is only going to take finite number of values. So n possible realizations, you know. High and low will be the simplest possible one, but you know, you can really have very rich 10 or 20 possibilities. There is going to be a, a stationary Markov chain that is going to tell you what is the probability that I will be, for example, high if today is low, or the probability I will be low tomorrow if today I'm low. Okay, so I'm going to follow recursive notation. Y prime is the probability, is the realization tomorrow, conditional on the realization today. Okay. Very important thing. I'm going to assume there is a law of large numbers. By this I mean, imagine that the probability that I get high is 40%. Then 40% of the population will get high. This has a technical difficulty, which is it really forces all these realizations not to be absolutely the same, not to be absolutely independent. Because we need to have a subtle way of dependence to ensure that we have this 40% of people getting the right shock in comparison with the 40% of the individual probability. There is a nice paper by Harald Ulick in Economic Theory where he actually shows all the math behind this. For our purpose, since we are going to do this in the computer, it doesn't really matter that much as long as we understand that the law of large numbers that we need to apply is not the regular law of large numbers. It's a more subtle one. 
and there is going to be a stationary distribution, capital Pi, of this associated with a lowercase pi of these different realizations of the labor endowment. Okay? So if you have some, basically you are going to have some uh, metric, some Markov chain with some movements up and down, this is going to imply that at the end we may have like 30, 40, and 30. Imagine that we have high, low, and medium, then we are going to have 30%, 40%, 30%. And that's going to be the stationary distribution associated with it. Okay? And at period zero, the income of all agents, the labor uh, endowment is going to be given, and the population, since we are going to be thinking about models without aggregate uncertainty and without transitions yet, I'll talk about transitions later on, it's going to be the case that the population distribution happens to be the stationary distribution. Okay? That we start exactly where uh, we were supposed to start. So the low, the total labor endowment in the economy is going to be a constant. And what is that? What is just the stationary distribution times the amount of labor in each of the points of the stationary distribution. So imagine that I have high, medium, and low. So what is the total? And the stationary distribution is 30, 40, 30. So what is the total amount of labor in the economy? High times 30 medium plus medium times 40 plus high times 30. And that's the total amount of the economy. Everything is stationary, so that labor is constant. Since we have a very nice and simple Markov structure, a history, capital T, remember the notation this morning, is the whole history of events, is just the multiplication, the factor of all probabilities period by period. So we start at y0, the probability of moving to y1, blah, 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 blah until the probability of moving from yt minus 1 to yt. Okay? So as I was saying before, this very simple setup really allows us, for having a allows us having a lot of idiosyncratic uncertainty, but there is not going to be aggregate uncertainty. And hence, there is at least a little bit of hope of having a stationary equilibrium with constant interest rate and constant wages that we can easily compute. Preferences, very simple. Each agent is going to have expected discounted utility, where the discount factor is going to be beta. The budget constraint is going to be my consumption plus some asset is going to be equal to my labor endowment times my wage, so that will be my labor income, plus the assets I had from yesterday, I carry from yesterday, times the interest rate on those. Very, very important thing. We don't have complete markets over here. Okay? You only have access to this uncontingent asset. That asset will not pay you more or less if you have a low or a high realization of your shock. Otherwise, there is no heterogeneity. The only thing we will do is, you know, we will just buy insurance. If labor is high, I will pay back some of my resources. If labor is low, I will get back some. But, you know, everyone will be consuming the same. They will be perfect risk sharing. Okay? So key thing over here to have heterogeneity is not only that you have labor heterogeneity, is that you cannot fully insure against that labor heterogeneity. And also, we are going to have some borrowing constraint. I'm not going to get into very careful discussion today about how we can specify it, where it can come from, because, you know, the point is really about computation, more about uh, pure uh, data or economics. So let me just suppose that the amount of assets that you can keep are bigger, needs to be strictly bigger than zero, that you can never borrow. A simple way uh, to justify that is, as Chris has done in many of his papers, is you just get unemployed from time to time, which will be one realization of this shock is zero, and you cannot pay back. And... You know, since you can get be really, really unlucky and get unemployed for the rest of your life, you will never ever be able to pay back, and that will be very bad. Okay? That's a simple justification, but there are many other justifications. Uh, and you know, maybe you can borrow up to $100,000, or to $10,000, or to 50% of your human capital. Who knows? That will really depend on the model you are thinking about. We are going to have, 
initial conditions of agents, so the assets at the beginning of time and the labor endowment at the beginning of time, and this is the key theme of these models with heterogeneous agents that is going to create all the problems. We are going to have a population measure. Okay? So this is going to be a distribution that is going to tell us how many people in the population has this level of assets and how many people in the population have this level of income, of labor income, such that, of course, the integral over this distribution will be one. So you can think, imagine that assets can be high and low and productivity can be high and low. We basically have four possibilities. So we'll have, I don't know, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 0.2, something like that. Okay? And this is really the key because the whole point about computing these models is to keep track efficiently of this distribution. And it's a very difficult object to keep track of because it's an infinite dimensional object. Okay? So we will think about how to keep track of it later on. And the allocation, of course, is just to be a sequence of consumption and asset holdings for each agent in the economy, given their initial conditions and some history of shocks. Technology, very standard product, aggregate production function with some standard assumptions. Capital depreciates at some rate in delta. And hence, we have an aggregate resource constraint where capital letters now are going to be aggregates, total consumption plus this is investment in the economy needs to be equal to production. Okay? And something that is important to remember is that the only asset in this economy is this physical capital stock. And that the, the A's that I was telling you before, they are really claims to that physical capital. So one constraint that we will have to ensure uh, holds in equilibrium is that the total amount of A integrating over all the agents in the economy is equal to the total amount of capital in the economy. And of course, we don't have any state contingent claims. As I was telling you before, we have, we have this very stark form of incomplete markets. However, we could have models where maybe there are only some limited assets and some limited amount of a state contingent claims, but you know, let's, let's learn how to compute the basic model first before we get into more complicated things. Uh, an equilibrium is a very basic object. I include just the definition of equilibrium for you to, to see it, but I'm not going to go over it, except for this slide over here. What this slide is telling you is this is total capital in the economy, this needs to be equal, actually, total capital that we carry into tomorrow. This needs to be equal to the total assets that each individual wants to carry over, given the history of each person, and integrating over the initial distribution. So I need to be sure I have an initial distribution of people. Each person in that initial distribution is going to evolve over time. Given the evolution of their labor endowment, they are going to decide how much assets they want to accumulate. Then when I integrate over all the people in the economy, I need to be sure that the total amount of assets they have is exactly equal to the total capital in the economy. It's just market clearing in the capital market. And the same for labor, although we already argued before that the total amount of labor was constant. This is consumption plus the total amount of capital needs to be equal to production plus undepreciated capital from yesterday. Okay? So the definition of equilibrium is very, very standard. The only thing I need to be sure is that I keep track of the right objects in terms of distributions to ensure market clearing and resource constraint. Okay. But maybe a better way to think about this model is to think about situations in, in a recursive equilibrium framework. Okay, so instead of thinking about this sequentially, let's think about this in a recursive framework, where we are going to have the individual state, is going to be A and Y, your asset and your income. We are going to have a distribution period by period of agents in A and Y. And basically what is going to happen, this is just the definition of where all these different objects are going to be. You don't need to worry much about it. What is going to happen is that we are going to have a transition function that is going to take one distribution of people 
and make it into another distribution of people tomorrow. Let me do a simple graph to illustrate this. So imagine that we just have I, uh, sorry, assets. And this, this is a distribution of people today. So that means that we have all these guys with this very high level of assets, and these guys with this very low level of assets, and these guys with these assets in the middle. So this is the distribution today. This person is going to make some decisions about how many assets to have tomorrow. This person will make decisions about how many assets to have tomorrow, so on and so forth. So we are going to have a new distribution tomorrow. I don't know, maybe this one. And what we are going to have is a mapping between the distribution today into the distribution tomorrow. And of course, what we are going to look for is situations where we are in a fixed point of that mapping, where this distribution and this distribution are the same. Okay? So the way to think about that is to write a value function for the agent, where now the value depends on the pure individual states, which will be A and Y, but also on the aggregate distribution. Why is the aggregate distribution a state for the household? Well, if this is an economy with a lot of capital, what will happen with the interest rate? It will be very low. Because remember, the interest rate is just going to be the marginal productivity of capital. If we have a lot of capital, because everyone has a lot of capital, the interest rate will be small. So I need to know not only the amount of capital, but also the distribution of capital. Because the distribution of capital matters for me to understand how much capital there will be in the economy tomorrow. Because the guy that has little capital will have a different marginal propensity to save than the guy that has a lot of capital. So that's why we have this object over here as a state, this aggregate state, which is the whole distribution in the economy. Now, on the right-hand side of the Bellman equation, I will have my utility today plus the discounted expected utility tomorrow which will be my value function with my assets tomorrow, my productivity tomorrow, and the distribution tomorrow. And I integrate over all the different realizations of Y prime. For me, the distribution is given, so there is no uncertainty about that, because it's, there is no aggregate uncertainty, so I don't need to do anything about it, but an A prime is the same. I'm picking my amount of assets today. Okay? So the only uncertainty is with respect to my productivity tomorrow. What is my budget constraint? Well, my consumption plus my assets tomorrow is equal to my wage that will depend on the amount of capital in the economy. Hence, it depends on the distribution. Why? The income, uh, my labor endowment, plus 1 plus R, the interest rate, which will depend on the, on the distribution of the economy times A. And then I will have this law of motion from the distribution today into the distribution tomorrow that I take as given. For me, it's exogenous. I'm just an epsilon person, so I just don't need to do anything about it. So you see the basic framework? You just have a bunch of these guys. Each of them takes the distribution as given. They need to keep track of the distribution because the distribution will determine their wages and the interest rate tomorrow. And they say, well, given my assets, given my labor endowment, and given my distribution, the aggregate distribution, what is my optimal choice? How do I evaluate that given my pay of today and my continuation pay of tomorrow? Okay? And I just have a definition of that, but that's not that interesting. Well, just a bunch of stuff. You don't need to know that. Okay. So the issue is how do I solve this problem in the computer? I jumped quite a bit to uh, page 17. <laughs> how 
How do I do this in the computer? How do I actually uh, compute this thing? Well, the first thing that I would like to know is if there is, in fact, an equilibrium, a recursive competitive equilibrium, which, surprisingly enough, uh, you know, it's not so easy to show, but, well, um, you more or less can do it. So, existence of a stationary recursive competitive equilibrium where we have a stationary distribution usually boils down to show that there is an asset market clearing condition where the total amount of capital in the economy is equal to the total amount of assets in the economy. You know, by uh, Walras law, we can forget about the goods market, and the labor market is always in, in equilibrium by definition, such that that asset market is given, is clear, sorry. And since the capital demand for firms is going to be defined by the traditional marginal productivity of capital, you know, we are going to have you know, all the nice properties that we need to show that there is an equilibrium, at least one equilibrium. It's a little bit more difficult to show uniqueness, and stability is even less well understood. The stability of the sense of what happens if we just, basically what I'm telling you over here is that if we start in the stationary distribution, we stay in the stationary distribution. But what if we just begin an epsilon away from the stationary distribution? We don't know that much. Okay. So how do you compute this? It's actually surprisingly simple in the case where you don't have aggregate uncertainty and you are searching only for the stationary competitive, recursive competitive equilibrium. What you do is the following. You say, well, let me pick an interest rate. The interest rate needs to be between minus delta. Why? Because even if the marginal productivity of uh, capital is zero, then, you know, I just need to still pay depreciation, so it cannot really go below that. And then, one minus beta minus one. Okay, so in the standard model, with only one representative agent, the interest rate in the steady state is one over beta minus one. Okay, just yes, that comes directly from the Euler equation. That will tell you, you know, I don't know. So you will cancel marginal utilities over here, and beta and R will need to satisfy that. Well, I will argue just in, one, in just one moment that in this model, agents are going to do a little bit of precautionary behavior. Okay, they have incomplete markets, so they want to ensure a little bit themselves against bad shocks, bad realizations. Which basically means that they are going to have, everyone in the economy is going to have a little bit more capital that they will otherwise have. Since there is going to be a little bit more capital, the manual productivity of capital is going to be a little bit lower, and hence the interest rate is going to be a little bit less than what the inverse of the discount factor minus one will give you. Okay? So if you have that the discount factor is 99, for example, 0.99, the interest rate is not going to be one. It's going to be, I don't know, maybe 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.95, you know. That depends on, on parameters, okay? But, you know, it's, it's what it's going to be. Okay, so what we do is the following. It's very simple. You say, look, let me pick a number between those two. That's going to be my initial guess for uh, the interest rate. In my particular case, I usually pick something quite close to 1 minus beta minus 1 because for a standard calibration, the precautionary behavior is not that amazing, not that big. Okay, so let's suppose that that is 0 0.01, so let me pick 0 0.008, like 20% less. Now, we are looking at a recursive competitive equilibrium, stationary version of it. So let me go back for a second to the problem of the household. Okay. This distribution and this distribution are the same. We are in the stationary situation. So I don't really need to know the details of that distribution. The only thing I need to know is how that distribution, whatever it is, implies for W and for R. 
but R is the guess I'm having now, and W is just going to come from the first order condition of the firm. Let me show you that. Okay? Basically, oh, I don't have it over here. Well, it's a pity. Basically, I know that if at some interest rate, the firm is going to operate so much capital, and that's going to operate so much uh, wage, so much labor, so I can compute the marginal productivity of labor, which is going to be the wage. Okay. So the only thing that I really need to know of the aggregate distribution is the interest rate. And then I'm just going to solve, this is a value function iteration, you know, plain vanilla, I'm facing these problems with my income uh, fluctuation problems, and I solve my value function iteration. Okay? And you can solve your value function iteration with whatever method you fancy. Okay? So if you are, you know, value function iteration guys, dynamic programming, dynamic programming. But if you want to apply any of the projection methods we learned in the previous section, that will be great as well. If you want to do perturbation, well, probably it will also work in many situations. Or you want to use perturbation as an initial guess for value function iteration. Okay? So basically what you say is, I have fixed the interest rate. I solve the household recursive problem because now I don't really need to worry about this aggregate distribution beyond the interest rate. And that will give me a decision rule for every agent in the economy. Okay? So basically, I will have a decision rule that tells me if you have this much level of capital, how much capital you want to have tomorrow. And what I do is, given some initial guess of the aggregate distribution, I just simulate over time, and I find the stationary distribution implied by the decision rules I just computed. And I say, well, how much capital is accumulated in that initial in that, ergo in that stationary distribution, and how much capital is demanded at that interest rate R? And if the answer is the same, voila, I found my interest rate. Or, you know, sufficiently small difference below some tolerance level. Voila, we found it. If not, I need to change R and adjust it you know, if I have too much, there is too much demand for capital, I raise the interest rate. If there is too little demand for capital, I lower the interest rate. Okay? So in some sense, this computation is very, very simple. I just say, look, since we are in the stationary distribution, the only thing I really care about is uh, this total amount of capital in the economy. I can keep track of all I need through the interest rates. I solve the problem of the household, I simulate it, everyone in the economy, I find the stationary distribution. Sometimes you don't even need to simulate, you can compute it directly if you have discrete choice problem, uh, you have discrete asset values, and I just adjust R until I clear the market. Questions about this basic algorithm? So it's very simple. Okay? Problem takes a little bit of time. <laughs> Okay, why? Because basically you are solving the problem of uh, the value function iteration, and then, you know, you need to compute the stationary distribution, which may be computational intensive, and then you need to come up with a new, inter you need to check whether or not the interest rate is the right one, and if it's not the right one, you need to start again, and you need to do it again and again, and, you know, sometimes it may take quite a few iterations of this whole thing before you actually converge to the right one. Now, as I was telling you before, in this model, it's going to be the case that the interest rate is going to have, a, it's going to be a little bit less than one minus over beta minus one because of this overaccumulation of savings. It can be because of liquidity constraints, because of prudence, or because of both. And the question there, I guess, two, two different questions. One is how big of a difference does this make? And, you know, I'm not going to review the literature, and, you know, there have people that have argued a lot, other people that have argued a little bit less, and, you know, there is a non-trivial amount of discussion over there. Uh, and, you know, if, if this was a more, if we had a little bit more time, I would be more than pleased to review that. But there is also policy implications. And the main policy implication is a somewhat surprising one, which is this is an economy where 
to a certain extent, we are saving too much. So anything that will lower a little bit saving may actually be good. And we know that in the model with a representative agent, the optimal tax on capital under many, many environments is just zero. Well, this is a model where you may want to have a little bit of a tax on capital to lower the amount of overaccumulation. Okay? So that's a very simple policy implication of this type of models and show you how many of the results, for, ex for instance, in public finance change where we think about them in an heterogeneous agents context. Okay, I'm going to show you a particular calibration and I will show you, you know, like doing a few experiments just to show you how this works. So let me suppose that I pick a constant relative risk aversion with values of the risk aversion of the sigma of 1, 3, and 5. So I'm going to do different combinations. Uh, the discount factor is going to be 0 0.96, which implies that the interest rate with complete markets will be 0 0.0416. You know, maybe not a bad approximation of the wall, an annual level. Cobb Douglas production function with alpha, the coefficient on top of capital of 0.36, and the, uh, the depreciation factor 8% annual level. Then you need to specify an earning profile. Okay? So you go to the data and you will look at some sources of micro data to try to understand how people's labor endowment or labor productivity changes over time. Again, if this was a complete semester, a complete quarter on heterogeneous agents model, believe me, I could talk about this for days and days and days. And there, is, there have been written more papers than anyone ever suspected about this, and a few more. Okay? Uh, without any type of endorsement, just let me put the simplest possible I know, which is autoregressive in logs. And, you know, we could have random walks. And that will be very interesting, but you know, that will force us to do a little bit more work. So just let me do something stationary, autoregressive, very, very simple. We have that the log of my laboring productivity tomorrow is a function of my labor productivity today and some shock. This thing, I'm just doing it to normalize the variance. And there is going to be uh, some, corre this is going to imply some correlation over time and some variances of shocks. And I'm going to play with situations where I have a lot of correlation, 0.9, situations where I have virtually no correlation, well, 0.3, no correlation at all, zero, and different levels of volatility. So things with high volatility and things with low volatility. Okay. Okay. So then, uh, how can you do this? How can you actually put this stochastic process in the computer? Well, something you can use is a method proposed by Tauken, which I briefly mentioned before, which is just a method that says, if I have an autoregressive process, how do I come up with a simple, discrete support distribution, Markov chain, that reproduces a lot of the properties of that process? Okay. And it's very simple, for example, if you pick seven possible events of the wall, what you do is you subdivide uh, the log of yt into uh, seven intervals, using this rule over here. You pick midpoints of those intervals. Well, this one is a little bit crazy because it goes to minus infinity, and this one goes plus infinity. So just let me pick three standard deviations, minus three and three standard deviations. And what I'm going to do is just going to apply a formula that you can find in Tauken's uh, paper, and you can find it in you know, any textbook in numerical methods like uh, Kenjat, to tell me what is the probability that I will jump from one position to the other. Remember, basically what we are having over here is we are going to have seven possible realizations. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and a matrix which is going to be 7 by 7. And basically what we need to do is fill each of these 49 probabilities. And what you want is that the probabilities are such that when you simulate from this Markov chain, that simulation from the Markov chain will look a lot like a simulation from the autoregressive process. In particular, they will have more or less the same moments. By the way, 
The token procedure is the one I have here because it has been the most popular in the literature. There is actually one that I like a lot. I was recently the editor for a paper uh, about that. That Rauwenhorst proposed many, many years ago. Uh, there is in this book by Tim Cooley, Frontiers of Business Cycle Research, and he has a chapter on asset pricing in this type of RBC models. And he proposes, it's an alternative to Tauken, and it was, I guess, no one really paying any attention for 15, 20 years, and recently a bunch of people have been looking at it, and it really has very, very nice properties. Okay? So, you know, I will invite you to read uh, the paper by Robin, and it's actually extremely simple to code. It's literally five lines. Okay, and it, it seems to work really well. So basically, this is nothing more than a system that will take you, uh, will allow you to fill the different entries of the seven by seven metrics. Okay, then given that transition, you find the stationary distribution. This is solved in this way. We know that uh, the distribution, the stationary distribution is to satisfy that when you put uh, the capital pi, the transition matrix over here, and you multiply by the stationary distribution, you get back the same thing. I hope I not make, okay, yeah, fine. And then you compute the total amount of labor implied by that distribution and you normalize, such that in fact we have a total amount of one. Okay. Uh, so I just take this model, I compute it in the way uh, I computed before, and I can, you know, compute things like the savings rate and uh, the interest rate, et cetera. And you can show a bunch of things. I have a very limited set of numerical results in the interest of time. But for example, the benchmark with complete markets is that you will have an interest rate of 4.16 and a savings rate of 23.7. And what you can show is that, for example, three things. One is keeping the risk aversion and the variance, the standard deviation of income shocks fixed, and increase in the persistence of the shock induces more precautionary saving and more accumulation of capital. Well, and that makes a lot of sense. Okay? So remember, shocks are good or bad. You know, you can have either a very good realization, a very bad realization. If you have, uh, if you know that you can have a very persistent bad realization, you are really afraid of that. So you are going to accumulate a lot in case that you have a very bad realization. However, if it happens to be the case that the persistence is very little, very small, you say, who cares about a bad realization? It's going to be washed out anyway in just one second. The same way, keeping the persistence fixed and the variance, the standard deviation of the shock fixed and increasing risk aversion will make you save more. Well, again, because you, you face the same amount of risk, but you hate risk more, so you want to be careful about it. And finally, the third combination is that keeping the, the risk aversion and the persistence fixed and increasing the volatility will lead you to accumulate more. Okay, again, because you are afraid and you are going to have a lot of shocks. Okay. So this was kind of the benchmark algorithm that you use to solve the basic model. You search for the stationary distribution, no aggregate uncertainty. And that's fine and that's interesting. Uh, and it solves, you know, it, can, it allows you to address really a lot of problems. But there are many other things that we are interested that involves some type of transition. So for example, uh, let's think about social security reform. Okay? Let's imagine that we go from having a social security system uh, where the retirement age is 67 to a social security system where the retirement age is 70. Or a social security with lower replacement rate. Or we are going to change the tax rate on capital. So we are not only interested in the final outcome, the new stationary distribution to which we converge, we are also interested in the whole evolution of this thing over time. 
Because actually, as I will argue in just one second, the welfare consequences of this type of policies may crucially depend on the transition. The best example is social security. It's usually the case that moving to, from a pay-as-you-go to a fully funded system, if you are just comparing the two steady states, the fully funded is better. But you need to finance that transition. And once you take account of the welfare costs along the transition, it's not obvious anymore that it's a good idea. Because basically, going from pay-as-you-go to fully funded, imagine that they want to do that right now. Well, I'm in a really bad situation. I'm 38 years old. It basically means that now for the next 25 years, I will need both to pay the retired people right now and to accumulate for my own saving. Very bad deal. If I'm 64, I say, what do I care? I'm about to retire anyway. And if you are 21, you may say, well, yes, it's true that I need to pay for this transition, but I'm going to be so many years under the new system that I may be better off. So you may be in a situation where the old and the young are in favor of the transition and the people in the middle are not. Okay? And this is the, tip, the perfect example of heterogeneity in situations. Or, you know, as I always say, the day I finish paying my mortgage, I radically change my attitude towards inflation. So before, when I had a large mortgage, inflation, great idea. Now that I don't have any mortgage, but I have a nominal income from pen, inflation, very bad idea. Okay? And this is the type of things you can think about with heterogeneous agent models. Okay, so let's think about the following exercise. Let's suppose that in a completely unexpected way, you know, tomorrow I'm elected president of the US and I change social security or I change taxes. How is the economy going to react and how I want to keep track of the whole distribution of things? Okay, uh, in particular, just to make things concrete, let me think about the case where I change, where I introduce a capital income tax at rate, ta, at, at, uh, rate tau. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the receipts of these taxes and I pay them back lump sum to everyone in the economy. What are the consequences of that? Well, the, this is actually very simple to compute if you are ready to accept one assumption, which is after T periods, you are in the new stationary equilibrium. T can be large, can be 200 years. But you are in the new stationary equilibrium. It's kind of a hard assumption to make because we know that convergence is going to be asymptotic. So think about the neoclassical growth model. We, you know, when we converge, we quite never get there even if we spend 2,000 years. But you know, you say, look, numerically, after, I don't know, after 30 years, we are close enough. It doesn't really matter. OK, so let's suppose that we say, in 30 years, we are in our new stationary equilibrium. So what do we do? Well, first, I take the algorithm I learned before, and I compute the stationary equilibrium for the economy without a tax on capital. Okay? So I get some interest rate, I find, solve the problem of the households, I find uh, the stationary distribution, does it clear markets? Yes, no. If no, I change the interest rate until I clear markets. Now, I do the same, but for the case where I already have the, the tax on capital. Exactly the same step. Okay, you can even use the same algorithm. It's just in the first one, you put tau equal to zero, and in the other one, you put tau equal to 0.1. Now, in some sense, this is a situation where I know we are seriously running out of paper. Okay, let me see. Okay, good. Think about time. We know where we start, and we know where we are going to end. And in some sense, what we want to know is how to compute this trajectory. So what we are going to do is the following. 
we are going to guess a sequence of capital. Okay? So I'm going to say capital at period one, period two, period three, ta, 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 until capital in period 20. And the good thing is, once I know the capital, well, my guess, you know, computing the interest, the wage is trivial. It's just the marginal productivity of labor. The capital is given. Labor is constant. The interest rate, again, the same. And I know what the tax, this is the total capital, the interest rate, the tax rate, this is the lump sum transfer. Okay? So as an agent, I know everything that I need to know. I can compute my value function in period one because I know what the interest rate is going to be in period one, I know what the wage is going to be in period one, but I also know what is going to be in period two. When I'm in period two, I know what is going to be in period two, but I also know how it's going to be in period three, and so on and so forth. So I can compute the whole path of value functions. Okay. It's actually even easier because I can do it backward. Since I know what V of T is, it's very easy to compute what V of T minus 1 is. You know, it's just I go to the Bellman equation, I know what VT is, I just solve for the decision today that gives me VT minus 1, and I do that backward until period 1. Okay? And then what I can do is I say, well, given those decision rules of the agents in these 20 periods, in each period there is going to be some decision of accumulation of capital. And given that accumulation of capital, I can look at the sequence that I guess of capital and the sequence that I computed of capital. And I can ask myself, did I clear the markets or not? Of course, this is a big pain because you need to clear, imagine that capital T is 20, you, in some sense you need to clear 20 markets. Okay? And the way you will probably like to do this in real life is with some type of Gauss-Seidel algorithm. Okay. So the idea will be, so you have 20 periods, you will try to make, to clear the market at period one, then you will move to period two and change the capital in period two and so on and so forth until time t, until time 20, and then start again. Until you have done this sufficient number of times that it converges. You don't want to change the whole guess at the same time because it will be a little bit too difficult. So you do it period by period, but then you cycle again and again. Okay? And that will give you the, um, the evolution of capital over time. That will give you the value functions, and we have computed our transition. So we can start asking relevant questions. What happens when we introduce this capital tax? Not only I will know the end, where we get to, but I, I will know the whole transition to that. Okay? And as I was saying before, this is particularly important for welfare because you really want to take account of the transition for your welfare computations. Okay. Let me show you an example to illustrate this. We are in time zero. What is my value function? What is the utility flow that I will get, the expected utility flow I will get in my life? Remember, this introduction of the policy is a surprise thing. It's a zero probability event that you never expected. Well, you say, I'm in the stationary distribution. Oh, and there is a beta missing over here. Sorry. There, is a, there should be a beta to the power of t over here. Okay? I'm in the stationary distribution. And given the stationary distribution, I'm going to get some consumption over time, and that's going to be my value function. So V sub zero is just my value function before the new policy is introduced. Now, there is also going to be a V1, which is going to be equal to V zero and this G, and basically what is happening over here is the following. B1 is the value function that you get in period one 
after you introduce the reform. Okay? So you wake up in the morning, you open the newspaper, and you say, oh my God, they introduced this reform. You say, well, my new value function is 22. I actually just computed that in my iteration here. Okay? I was just doing that thing, so I computed that. Well, now I can ask you the following question. How much money will you be ready to pay me? Or to pay, sorry, to avoid that policy reform? Or how much money will you be willing to pay to get that policy reform? Okay? Well, that's very simple. You just say, this is the value that I get after the reform is going to be equal to the value I will get before the reform and this G, and basically what this G is, is the compensation that I will get period by period because of the reform, which can be positive or which can be negative. Okay? And since it's constant period by period, I can take it out of this expectation, and again, there is a beta missing over here. Okay? So what you, but this thing over here is just the value that I had before the reform. So what you have is that V1, the value function that you get in the first period right after the reform, is the value function you had before the reform times 1 plus G, 1 minus sigma, where G is the compensating differential. Is exactly how much money you will pay in consumption units to avoid waking up and reading the newspaper they introduce this tax on capital. And then, of course, I know this, I know this, we computed that from our previous algorithm, so I can just find G in a very trivial way. And that's the welfare cost of the reform. And the reason why this is different from the welfare, the steady state welfare comparison is because in the welfare state comparison, we will not use V1, but Vt, which is the value function after the whole transition has happened. And of course, this G and this steady state welfare may be very different objects. Now, in the literature, you are going to find that in many, many times, people look at this number instead of this number. And the main reason is because computing the stationary distribution under the new policy and under the old policy is relatively straightforward. It's just, in some sense, it's solving the model twice. And then you just use this and you, you are done. But if you need to compute the whole transition, that's really quite a bit of a pain because you need to go one after the other period by period. So people tend to be lazy and they don't want to compute this. They just compute this. And the problem is that this is really a very biased view of what the, social, of what the reform is. And as in the case of social security I was just showing you, it may give us a very bad view of what the real issues are at hand. Okay? Questions? Okay, so we learn how to think about models with heterogeneity when there is no aggregate uncertainty. And we thought about a first move towards a more interesting situation, which you have these transitions. But these transitions was an unexpected shock, happened once in a lifetime, and you know, we never saw it ever again. But you, know, you can say, look, I, I really care I really want to think about models where there is aggregate uncertainty and this is continuous over time. In the sense that you know, it happens every period I have an aggregate shock. You know, the typical example is economic fluctuations, the business cycle, and their interaction with idiosyncratic uncertainty. So we really want to understand how you can combine business cycle fluctuations at the aggregate level with a lot of things that happen at individual level. Okay? This is, for example, my favorite, uh, my favorite illustration of this is about job creation and job destruction. We know that job creation and job destruction behave very differently over the business cycle. When we are at the beginning of a, of a downturn, there is a lot of job destruction. Okay? A lot of factories closing, a lot of firms getting out. 
So you are really going to have this distribution of firms and jobs changing over time because we have an aggregate shock. That really gives, you know, opens the door to thinking about many, many super interesting problems in macro. The problem is, of course, or the, or the challenge is how to compute that equilibrium because now we need to keep track of the distribution. The distribution is a state variable. What we did before was in some sense to, you know, to get around that problem just by imposing that we were a stationary distribution. So instead of keeping track of the whole distribution, we only needed to keep track of the interest rate and the wage that distribution implied. But now, every di distribution is going to imply some different interest rate, so different wages, and more importantly, a different distribution tomorrow. And that makes this a very difficult problem. Okay. And as I was saying before, it basically gives us an infinitely dimensional object, which is very difficult to handle, and we have very, very limited results about existence, about uniqueness, about stability, about how good the approximations are. Uh, I don't know, you want me to continue? This is like when you go to the doctor and he tells you, this is everything that is wrong with you, and I have three more pages. Okay? So really, our understanding of this type of environment is very, very limited. Very limited. Which is a pity, because we really think that this combination, at least you know, in my heart of hearts, I think that you know, idiosyncratic uncertainty and aggregate uncertainty need to interact in an important way. Okay? Think about, let me just do a detour. We are getting at the end of the day, so for one second we can at least you know, just think outside the box. There is a lot of stories these days about the recovery being very slow because people are really burdened by very large debts. You know, households have very, very, have very, very large uh, debts and then they don't want to consume and you know, that has lower aggregate demand, blah, 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 okay, fine. Well, at the core of this story is a story about heterogeneity. That there is a lot of people with a lot of debt that do not want to consume and a lot of people with little debt that do not want to consume either because of the zero lower bound, the interest rate is not sufficiently low to induce them to consume today. Okay? So if you really want to think about this model and this type of stories about balance sheet recessions in a really serious quantitative way, you will need to have a model with heterogeneous agents with aggregate uncertainty or with a lot of idiosyncratic uncertainty. Okay? And I really think this is a challenge. It will be very interesting if someone could you know, make progress on it and having, you know, it's, this is story, I mean, I believe this story. It's not that I, I'm against it. I'm just saying, yes, I believe it, but I don't know. I haven't really seen quantitative models that tell me that my priors are right and not just product of my own prejudices. Okay. okay. So let me show you this instead of in a very general framework in a very concrete example where we are going to have business cycles, and they are going to be the super boring business cycles, the most boring business cycle you can imagine. So the economy can either have high or low productivity. So SB is bad times, and SG is good times. It's high or low productivity, and there is a transition probability. So sometimes we are high, we move to low. Sometimes we are low, we move to high. So this is the most boring, irrelevant, and absolutely uninteresting model ever of the business cycle, but it helps us to understand what is going on. And also, there is going to be labor productivity, and labor productivity is also going to be very, very uninteresting. It's going to be only two possible positions. You are either unemployed or you are employed. Okay, unemployed, you can think about it as making zero income, or maybe some type of unemployment insurance. Employed is you are making some income. And what is going to happen is that those probabilities are being correlated with the business cycle. So when you are in good times, there is going to be a lower probability of being unemployed. And when you are in good times, there is going to be, no, the other way around. When you are in bad times, you will have a higher probability of being unemployed. And when you are in good times, you will have a higher probability of being employed. Okay. So each agent is going to face a transition matrix. This is going to be their productivity tomorrow, whether employed or employed. This is going to be the aggregate state. 
which will depend on the aggregate state today and the productivity today. And this is going to be a four by four matrix because you know, there are four different combinations of things that can happen. Again, by the law of large numbers, I want to be sure that there is a consistency going on over here. That if, 40, if you have a 40% probability of being unemployed, given that the states are good, 40% of people will be unemployed when the states are good. Okay? And this is just some algebra to ensure that these probabilities are right. You know, it's just, um, you know. Over here, what I'm doing is I'm integrating summing over y primes, and over here I'm just doing the base theorem to have the right conditional distribution. Fine, nothing very deep. So now, the individual, when we go to the recursive formulation, the household will need to keep track of the individual state variables, A and Y, and the aggregate state variables, S, and the distribution. Okay? And you can see over here how the value function will depend on these four variables. This is a number, this is a number, this is a number, but this is a whole distribution. And they are going to maximize, they are going to choose consumption and asset given their utility function, and given that tomorrow they will be in this value function with this asset, this productivity, this aggregate state, this aggregate distribution, and the probability of moving given their states today to these states tomorrow, and we sum over all different possibilities. And what is the law of motion? Sorry, the budget constraint. Consumption plus assets tomorrow are the wages times Y plus 1 plus the interest rate times A, where all these things depend on the aggregate states. And then, of course, we have the law of motion for the aggregate distribution that says the distribution tomorrow, given the states today and the shock tomorrow, will be this thing. Okay, so this is something that is realized at the beginning of next period. Questions about this? Okay, very long definition of recursive competitive equilibrium. We don't need to go over there again. Uh, the interesting thing is we will have a transition function for the, law of, for, the, for the distribution against, this is just notation, so let me not use uh, much time on it. The problem is, as I was already advancing before, that we really need to think about how to forecast that distribution tomorrow. Okay? Because forecasting the distribution tomorrow will tell us what are going to be the future prices. But the problem is that I need to know every single person and the situation of every single person in this economy. Because, for example, if A prime were linear in A, if I will always save the same amount or the same proportion regardless of my assets, I wouldn't need that. Because I will just be able to say, well, everyone is saving 20% of their income, so I just look at the assets of everyone, I, the income of everyone, I just compute 20% of that. The problem is, for example, if you are very poor, if you, are very, you have very low assets, it may be the case that you will save very, very little, but if you have a loss of assets, you may save a lot in proportion, eh? not, not in absolute levels, in proportion. If that case is true, if you don't have the same slope for all different things, then it will be the case that you really need to know where everyone is in the distribution today. And that makes this really, really difficult. So Per Crusell and Tony Smith, uh, I think that what, already like 15, 16 years ago, came out with a very smart idea, which is the following. Instead of keeping track of the whole distribution, which is something extremely, extremely complicated, just keep track of a few moments of the distribution. For example, the mean and the standard deviation. Yes, this is not really the whole distribution, but you know, if the moments are informative enough about the whole shape of the distribution, this may be good enough. You see the idea? So let's think about M as the vector with the first n moments of the asset distribution. And what is going to happen is that instead of having the exact law of motion 
for the distribution that is impossible or nearly impossible to keep track of, what agents are just going to have is a love motion for these end moments. There are two interpretations for this type of trick. One is that agents are bounded rationally, boundedly rational. You just cannot keep, or cells cannot keep track of the whole distribution of agents in the US economy. So we just keep track of a few moments. Okay? Another interpretation of this is as a pure computational trick. I think I'm a little bit more convinced by the agents being boundedly rational. It seems to me a little bit more coherent with the spirit of the algorithm. Okay? And then, so the first thing is the idea we are going just to keep track of some moments instead of the whole distribution. The second thing that we are going to do is we are going to parameterize. We are just literally to guess one functional form for this law of motion. And what Crusell and Smith suggest is to have just this linear function in the log of capital. So they say, let's forget about all the moments except the first one. The only thing we care about is the average amount of capital, and the average amount of capital tomorrow is going to be a linear function of the log capital today. Where this A and this Bs are indexed by the state, the aggregate state. So they will be different. You know, they, they need to let aggregate uh, states enter into some way, so they are going to let this be either big or low. This will be the household problem, which is the same as before, except that now, instead of having the whole distribution over here, we have capital and capital tomorrow, and instead of having the whole law of motion, we just have this log evolution, law of motion for the log capital. Okay? Given A, S, and B, S, this is an extremely simple value function problem. And you can solve it using any type of method that you are familiar with to solve dynamic programming problems. For example, the projection methods we were talking before, perturbation. Okay? So again, the only thing that is different from the aggregate, you know, from you know, a very plain vanilla problem is you need to keep track of this case, and you know that the evolution of K is given by this thing, which is exogenous to you, by the way, which makes it even simpler. You are still only maximizing overconsumption and assets. So how do you guess, or how do you find this, of course, works when you have AS and BS. So what do you do? Well, you guess, remember that we have high and low, so you need to guess two A's and two B's. So you guess those four numbers, and you solve the problem of the agents in the economy. And then you simulate for a very, very large number of periods for a very large number of households. Okay, so you say, let me take one million households, let me give each of them the decision rules I just solved, and I'm going to get them, you know, operate over 100 years, and I will look at how capital, the aggregate capital in this economy will work over time. Okay? And then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to regress the capital tomorrow in, periods, in the next period, on capital today, of course, conditioning on whether or not we were in good or bad times. And I'm going to look at my estimates of AS and BS. If the R square for this regression is high, and in addition, the estimates alpha and beta are very close to my A's and my B's that I guessed before, I'm done. Okay? So this is in some sense kind of a guess and verify. You say, I guess that the law of motion for capital gets determined by A and B. I'm just going to simulate the economy. I'm going to run that regression in the simulated data. I'm going to get some alpha and beta. If they are the same that A and B, I'm done. If not, 
I will need to change and update those guesses. And it's actually not very easy to do that update because there's not a clear rule of how to do it. Okay? It may be the case, though, that the guesses for A and B have converged, but that the R square is still low. Okay, we still do not have a very good fit. And then what Crusell and Smith suggest is that we increase the number of moments that we need to keep track of. Okay. Questions about the Crusell and Smith algorithm? Okay, so just let me show you quickly a calibration of how this thing will work. The period is going to be one quarter. Constant relative risk aversion utility, log utility, just to simplify your life. A discount factor is going to be 0 0.99, alpha 0 0.36. The discount factor, the depreciation is going to be 9.6 aggregate at the annual level is 0 0.25 at the quarterly level. Okay, so there are going to be two aggregate states. Remember, this is a super boring model of the business cycle. It can be aggregate productivity can be either 0 0.99 or 1.01. 1 .01. Okay, so very low volatility, just you know, a little bit high, a little bit low. And it's going to be a symmetric transition matrix. Again, this is probably not a good representation of the data because remember this morning I was telling you that expansions are long and smooth and recessions are sharp and short. I guess we could do that. They are very easy to introduce in that thing. But let me keep things simple here. So the way uh, we are going to say is, well, let's suppose that the average expansion lasts for eight quarters. The average recession lasts for eight quarters. So that basically means that in my transition matrix, remember the diagonal is the probability of a stain where we are now. This will be seven eighths, and the probability of getting out is one eighth. Okay, this is just an exponential distribution. You know, it's just if I know that I'm going to be eight periods on average, it means that in every period I have one eighth, oops, one eighth probability of getting out. The idiosyncratic component. Okay, so remember we have these two states, employment and unemployment. Unemployment, if you are employed, you make one. You have one unit, well, it's not that you make one, it's that you have one unit of time uh, and get one wage. If you are unemployed, you only get 25%. And I think about this as, you know, some insu unemployment insurance, maybe some moonlighting, you know, some jobs you did here and there, or maybe it's household production, by the way. You know, if you are unemployed, you may take the time to, you know, do some gardening. Now, I need to specify the transition matrices. Okay? And instead of specifying the 4x4 four four matrix, I'm going to specify four 2x2 two two matrices. It's a little bit easier. And I'm going to do the following. I'm going to assume that if we are in an expansion, you are going to be unemployed one and a half quarters, six weeks. So which means that you know, the probability of being unemployed, if you are unemployed today, is one third. And the probability of being employed if you were unemployed today is two thirds. So you get out of unemployment very fast. If it is in recessions, it's worse. It's two quarters and a half. So that will give me 0.6 and 0.4. And the other thing I need to specify is what will happen with these probabilities where not only I'm switching, but also the aggregate economy is switching. Okay? So over here, the probability of staying unemployment was one third when the economy is staying in a expansion. And over here it was 0 0.6 when the economy is staying in a recession. But what happens when the economy goes from an expansion to a recession or from a recession to an expansion? Well, I'm going to assume that the probability of remaining unemployed is 1.25% higher. And the uh, when you go from bad times, good times to bad times, and the, the other way around is 0.75% higher when you go from bad times to good times. This is basically saying, worst moment to get unemployed when the economy is getting into a recession. Best time to get a job 
when the economy is getting out of a recession. And this captures you know, kind of the intuitive idea that when we are getting into a recession, we are closing down a lot of factories, a lot of people is being fired. When we are already in the recession, you know, not that many people is fired, but you don't get jobs that easily. And when we are getting out of the recession is when we are opening a lot of factories, so it's very easy to gain a job. So we put all these things together, um, fine. You get all these different entries of the probability matrix. You know, yes, I'm not that interesting to discuss each of them. And the model, you know, we put this in the computer. Um, since we don't have that much time, I didn't really bring code to show you this, but it's actually not that deep. And by the way, Tony Smith has all the code of this stuff on his webpage. So if you go to his webpage at Yale, you can download the code. And if you put Crusella Smith code on Google, you will find 20 different people that have versions of this. And then you are going to get the aggregate loss of motion, you are going to get the individual decision rules, and the time-varying cross-sectional wealth distributions. Okay? Uh, just to say a few more things, this will be the converged loss of motion. So in particular, where times are good, this will be like, this coefficient will be 0.962. When times are bad, it will be 0.965. Uh, you can see basically in the intercept that you will save a little bit more in good times than in bad times, because basically you want to do intertemporal consumption smoothing. You want to save more when income is high. And we can ask the question, you know, how irrational are agents? Since they are doing this bounded rational thing, uh, we can compute the R square. And the R square of this thing is going to be 9999998. Okay? So this is a very, very good approximation of the law of motion that we are having over there. Okay? Uh, the problem, I, I don't want to get into the discussion, the problem about this thing is that it is not obvious that an R square, a very, very high I square, R square can be uh, is such a good informative statistic of goodness of fit. Uh, Bauter de Han has examples where extremely high R squares actually imply huge utility losses for the agents, and where the equilibrium, the exact equilibrium, is actually very far away from the exact from the from the approximated one. Okay, so the R square is probably not a terribly good statistic, but it's the one that most people uh, use. And well. When you look at these two graphs, the main lesson that you get away, and this is a little bit of a disappointment of Crusella Smith, uh, and it's kind of a, a result that has bothered people since it first came out, is that you don't see a lot of action between bad and good times. I mean, the coefficients they are a little bit different, but it's pretty much the same. And second, it doesn't seem that heterogeneity matters that much, because you are doing a very good job with just one period, sorry, with just one moment. So, you know, I set up this whole heterogeneous agent model class, you know, talk, tell, telling you about how exciting these models are, and then I say, look, at the end of the day, it doesn't really seem to matter that much. That's very disappointing. Okay, and people have really tried to think carefully about how to get around that, because there is really the prior, I think, is still there, that this interaction between individual and aggregate uncertainty matter a lot. And the reason is very, very simple. Uh, and it's basically because, yes, it is true that not everyone has the same marginal propensity to save, but at the end of the day, except the guys who are extremely poor, everyone else is going to have nearly the same marginal propensity to save. And the guys who are extremely poor, who cares about them because they don't save anything? Remember, in the US economy, the bottom 80% of the population owe nothing. So the fact that they have very different marginal propensities to consume that me, who I own quite a bit, is absolutely irrelevant because it doesn't matter. So you, in some sense, you only need to think about maybe the top 20% of the distribution. And in this type of environment, this top 20% of the distribution, nearly everyone is going to have the same marginal propensity to consume. So you have this thing that is called quasi-aggregation. So, as I was saying, this is a little bit of a letdown, but you know, I still believe that there are many other situations 
where heterogeneity with things like age, with things like entry exit into the job market, entry exit of firms, etc., will deliver very interesting results. It doesn't seem the case that we have put our finger on them yet. 